And may we all keep our struggles. Uh, may we all keep our journey. It's not always an easy journey, is it? And there are many things that can, can pull us down. But Jesus Christ is everything. God is everything. Those are the two things, by the way, we're going to be talking about today, the two, two individuals. And um, he's, he's everything. We want to follow after our God because the reward of such is, is so huge. So we're thinking about memorial <clears throat> this weekend as we're thinking about the fallen, those who have given their lives in military service. We think about a memorial, and there are two things that come into play. Something is very, very significant. For it to be a memorial, there had to be something significant take place. And then secondly, something so significant that it needs to be remembered. It cannot be forgotten. Now, unfortunately, many significant things have been forgotten throughout all of humanity. Uh, anytime you delve just about anywhere in history, you start reading about the significant and things that hardly anybody has heard of because it's been buried in history. A few things kind of get remembered, but that's only for a little while in a particular culture until that culture disappears or evolves into something, something else, and uh, it's not what it used to be. But something significant should be remembered, and that's the basis of a memorial. That's, that's what we have this weekend. So we have, you know, the Mount Rushmore and remembering uh, some of the presidents. There should be other presidents up there as well. But uh, Borglin, as I recall uh, his name, had in mind these individuals to remember and, and what, they, what they stood for. And so here's something very significant, and here is something that should not be forgotten, and perhaps it is being forgotten in our day. Uh, here's another memorial that we are familiar with that represented to, to a strong degree the idea of, of liberty. And uh, perhaps that's being forgotten as well, but, but something very significant. And then, you know, you can't just forget this. And we have, of course, as I said, what's going on this weekend with the memory of those that have given their lives in, in military service. We have, we just have memorials everywhere. There's even a memorial on the moon uh, for all of those astronauts and cosmonauts, Russians and Americans that, that have given their lives is this memorial uh, for that list of individuals. And there are actually quite a few that have given, given their lives. So we come back to something significant and something that should not be forgotten. It really should be remembered. So today, of all the things we could talk about, there are very many things that would come under significant. But I'd like for us to go to the top of the list. Let's go to the most significant things of all. And that has to do with God and Jesus Christ. Not to leave the Holy Spirit out of it, but today to follow out some scriptures that have to do with memorial and remembering. And in particular, with, uh, with our great... Yahweh, Jehovah, God, and the great I Am, and then turning our attention to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, priority, priority items that never should be forgotten, should always be remembered, and should always be remembered in our lives and how we conduct our lives. And that's really where we're going today. First of all, we have the idea of, of a remembrance that we should have of God as Jehovah and as the great I am. And I love this introduction in Exodus 3. As God is calling Moses and he is now going to build the nation of Israel and construct the tribe of the Savior. So there's going to be a family. It's all messianic. It's all God's, God's execution of bringing the, the Messiah to earth. But God is introducing himself even to Moses to some degree. And so he calls Moses and he, he talks to Moses and he, he tells Moses he wants to go and Moses to go and to, uh, to enforce or to persuade Pharaoh to let his people go. And he says, I will certainly be with you. This shall be a sign to you that I've sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? That's a really good question for where Moses was at this point. <laughs> Who shall I say? They don't really know God. They're having to be taught God. Who shall I say is sending me? Obviously, Moses is very impressed at this particular point with the burning bush and all that and this great power that, that he is in front of. But who shall I say is sending me? And 
Here is what God wants Israel to know, and it's really in two parts here. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. This is actually a very huge statement that I think it's very easy to take for granted. God used the term I am, and you know, at first you, you wonder, is he, you know, is he playing with philosophy and is he, uh, is he kind of going the, you know, Descartes and uh, I think, therefore, I am, and is he trying to, to kind of build this philosophical direction? No, it has nothing to do with that. What he's doing is he's, he's talking about the great reality of all things. He says, I am, and that idea is to exist, to be or to, to become. And when Moses says, who shall I say has sent me, God says, tell him I exist sent you. Now, just kind of keep that in mind, because we're going to be bringing that into our discussion here. But the second term we talked about not too long ago is the idea of Jehovah or Yahweh, depending on how you look at the vowel points there. <clears throat> Moreover, God said to Moses, now the next verse, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. And there's the idea of Lord, which we remember is the idea of the self-existent one. He's the eternal self-existent one. It's the idea God, God is what he is due to nobody. God is what he is only due to himself. And this is very interesting. Between I am and Jehovah, you know, we come to, to some very, very impressive things about God. And what God was informing Moses to do was to go inform the Israelites of the actuality of that there is a God, a true, a true God, the actuality of that fact. There is a real God among you. I exist, self-existent one. And I think this is very interesting because Egypt was full of all kinds of gods. In fact, millions of gods. If something moved in Egypt, they worshipped it. That's really what it comes down. It didn't matter if it was bugs, if it was the Nile, if it was something in the Nile, it, it didn't matter. And the, the millions and millions of gods that, that could do nothing, they, they were without thought, they were without action. And we come back to when God says, tell them I am has sent you. We have this God who is a God of thought. We have this God who's the God of existence. And we have Jehovah as the self-existent one and this one who, who owes all of his existence only to himself, which was a great contrast to the gods who only owed their existence to whom? Get your axe, son. Let's go chop down a tree and we'll make a god. That's really what it came down to. They had no thought. They had no action. There never was one. What a great contrast. And here's the, the actuality of God, the reality of God. Go tell them I am. Go tell them the one that exists is the one that is sending Moses. But secondly, we see, a, I think, a very interesting idea of, of the simplicity and summation of the one God over all things. I, I am who I am. I, who shall I say has sent me? God didn't say, go tell them the God of the seas, the God of the land, the God of the clouds, the God of the sky, the God of the moon, the God of the sun, the God of the stars. Go tell them the God of all these things is sending you. He doesn't say that. It's like the ultra umbrella simplicity. Who shall I say has sent me? Tell them the existent one has sent you. Tell him. Tell them the, the self-existent one who owes his existence to no power but to himself has sent you. And we, we see this ultra-simplicity, although a great complexity we, we know, but the, the ultra-simple thought that, that God is the one that is over all. God is the great umbrella. All things fit under God. And that's what God was trying to teach the Israelites who, who kept wanting to go everywhere they went. They kept wanting to, to build their, their idolatry again. And God was trying to get this simple thought into their minds. 
understand the great simplicity. God is God. He's God above all. God is over all. He's the one that exists. He's the great power. If you want to know him, think about the term, I exist, which was true in the past, true in the future, true in the future. It was something irrespective of time. This is who God is. And there's another term that in similar fashion perhaps gives this this concept in Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, Jehovah, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. The idea of first and last, that, that's pretty inclusive. <laughs> Alpha, Omega, A to Z, first, last. There's the great umbrella from first to last. Where does everything fit in? It all fits in under the umbrella of the first and the last. Everything is created fits under that umbrella. What's happening on any particular day, it, it, it fits under that, that umbrella. Your purposes of life fits under that umbrella. Your hope, any, anything you're looking forward to in death, Jesus, it, it all fits under this great umbrella. I am the first and the last. God is over all. And he is the great I am, the one before whom you have to do. How many are of these, Lord? Beside me, there is no God. There's one God. So here's something very, very significant. But in this also, we see the idea of the unchangeability through time, where he takes the great I am and the Lord, Jehovah, that, that word Lord, we, we remember from our study here recently, capitalized, right, all uppercase letters, the Lord, the God of Abraham, etc. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Who is God going to be to all generations? He's going to be the same God. The same God of Moses. The same God that created the world. The same God that, that tried to lead Israel. The same God of eternity in either direction. It's all the same God the unchangeable God. There is no power that can change God. There is nothing that comes to God and makes him modify himself. You can't be this. You better evolve. You better adapt if you're going to, to keep, uh, keep yourself around. It didn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. This is the unchangeable God that will always be here. He will always be the, the all-powerful, almighty God. And he says that... This is my name. I am dovetailing. I am. Tell them the I am have sent you. And then he said again, tell them the Lord has sent you. And this is my name forever. And this is my memorial. That's why we're talking about the idea of memorial. Something to be remembered. We have God setting forth his own name as something that should be remembered. You see that? And that's why we said in the beginning, this is, we're going to the top of all the priorities. You know, where, where do you go above this? The top of all the priorities is you, you remember your God. And that's what he told Israel in Deuteronomy. Remember that the theme of Deuteronomy is, anybody remember? I just said it. Remember your God. That's the theme of Deuteronomy. Remember your God, because you're going to go and you're going to be blessed and you're going to have, have many horses and you're going to have uh, uh, multiply your gold and your silver. And you're going to have houses. And he says, then you're going to forget the Lord. That was the warning of Deuteronomy 8 and 11. And so the theme, as this people is getting close to entering the promised land, when you enter, you'd better remember your God. And this this is what we're all about, of course, as people of God. Here is the remembrance of, of our Lord, wherein we're going to keep God in front of us. Here's his name as the memorial to, to invoke the name God and remember everything that he is, because this is huge. God is the universal umbrella for all that is, as we have already seen. That includes your life. That was not just Moses. It wasn't just the Israelites. It's you, too. 
You breathe because of your God. Your heart is beating because of your God. You think, you have abstract thought because of your God. Everything comes into the universal almightiness of the Lord our God. And yes, this has to do with you and me, doesn't it? It doesn't matter where the world goes and all of its philosophies, how far it tries to get away from God. Here's the ultimate reality that all of us should be plugging into and investing our lives in because God is the great almighty umbrella over all things. And humans really should be fully occupied with the thought of the divine, just like Moses was trying to teach the Israelites in Deuteronomy. Keep God always in your focus, people. Remember your God? That's stay focused on your God. Keep your eyes on God. Don't, don't take your eyes off of God. If you will do this, then you will serve the Lord your God. And when we realize who God is as the great I am, as Jehovah, the self-existent one, we realize what else, where else would, would we put our eyes? Where else would we put our focus? Our focus must be on our God. He's the great reality in front of us. Everything else is only of this world. Go to the cemetery and look up any kind of story that you want to in a cemetery. And you find there's one great reality for all those people. No matter what they did in their lives, and no matter what the dash between the dates might have looked like in their lives, no matter what, the only great reality is God, and they left everything else behind. This is where we should be focusing. This is what is important. Humans should be occupied with the thought of the divine. Remind it again, uh, Trent, what's, what's the guy that we both listen to sometimes? What, who's that? Yeah, Peterson. Uh, he talks about the idea. He's been, he'd been slow to come to, the, to a recognition of Jesus Christ. But he talks about the idea, you know, somebody asked, do you believe in God? And, and he, it's like he stopped Jordan Peterson. And... Do you believe in God? And the point that he makes is to answer that question is so much bigger than we can possibly comprehend. If you believe in God, does not, does not thought, doesn't that like totally eradicate everything you know, unnecessary in your life? Doesn't that rebuild everything within you? Doesn't that re transform all of your philosophies doesn't that remake everything in you? And wouldn't you do anything that, if God exists, wouldn't you do anything that that God wants you to do? And then he says, that's why I'm really slow to answer the question, do you believe in God? And I think that's a really good response that all of us need to think about. Oh, I believe in God. Oh yeah, what does your life say about, what, about your believing in God? Humans should be fully occupied with the thought of the divine. And, but to remember that it's not just our mentality. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth, Ecclesiastes 12, is not a mental ascent. Remembering your creator is about how you live your life. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter of Ecclesiastes after a man has followed out all the philosophies and all the carnality and all the sensual pleasures and everything that, that, that humans can get in this world. He makes this conclusion. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. That's a big phrase right there. For this is man's all. What do we invest ourselves in that we kind of persuade ourselves this is, this is the all? But again, what are we going to do with all that stuff? Nobody on earth ever took the all of this world with them. It's all left behind. The all of mankind, the everything of mankind, of every human, is to see God as the great umbrella, power, almighty of all things. And how do I fit into what he is trying to accomplish? And what must I do to be in his fellowship? And so we need to live this memorial, don't we? 
Jehovah, the great I am, the existent one. If he exists, it has some follow through in our lives. It, it does touch upon us. We need to keep our focus on this God. And this is very important. The idea of focus, memorial, is very important. This is too important to be forgotten. Many people forget their God. Believers sometimes go their way and they, they forget their God. But here he's trying to teach us. Keep your eyes there. If you keep your eyes on God, you know, you know where you're going. If you keep your eyes on God, you'll be following your God. And he is the most important thing. Secondly, and segue, of course, to the important thing. Remember the sacrifice of Jesus. We're talking about memorial, things that cannot be forgotten. Oh, by the way, who is the great I am? You know that Jesus himself called himself the great I am? Jesus being tested and hated by uh, some in conversation with him said, most assuredly I say to you before Abraham was, I lived. No, that's not what he said. Before Abraham was, I am. What an interesting term to use. Why would he say something like that? Because he was appealing right back to Genesis 3.14 and telling these Jews who he was. Who is Jesus? He is God. And you know what? They understood what he said because they took up stones to throw at him. No man can take such blasphemy upon himself, they thought, as to call himself the great I am. And so we have Jesus himself as this one to be remembered. He, he is the great I am. Did he author that back at that point? That might have been the son. In Isaiah, it's, the, it's at least two beings talking about, mentioned in one verse, that are distinct from one another. And yes, that very well could have been Jesus uh, bringing about the narrative. But Jesus in Revelation is, is talked about as this, this beginning and end, as the Alpha and the Omega and the first and the last. And remember that great image that is the, the foundation of the prophecies of Revelation, uh, just like Ezekiel, beginning with great, this great image uh, that is more than we can understand that founds the message of Ezekiel. Revelation starts the same way as the great image of Jesus Christ. And he is the one that is the source of this message that's going to take place in Revelation. And he said, this is what the image says, and, and this, it's a great image. Uh, his head and hair white like wool, John sees in a vision. And his eyes like a flame of fire, his feet like fine brass. This is all just an image, of course. It's not saying this is what Jesus looks like in, in real life. But he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand upon me. What a friendship, right hand. Saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. If you examine this text, it's talking about Jesus. This is Jesus, one like the Son of Man. It's the testimony of Jesus in this chapter that's being discussed. And what does Jesus say about himself? I am the first and the last. That puts Jesus in pretty important company, doesn't it? That puts Jesus at the top of the list. But that's not really where we're going today. Uh, perhaps neither is this. Uh, we, of course, uh, we, in fact, we just did it. What do we do when we take the Lord's Supper? We remember Jesus. And not just Jesus, but we remember the very fact that Jesus became one of us and gave himself for us for our sins. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 talks about doing this, that, uh, that Jesus had instituted this, saying, take and, and eat. Uh, this is, uh, do this in remembrance of me, to remember the body. And in verse 25, take uh, the, the cup and you drink it. This is the new covenant in my blood. And this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You know, there's a remembrance. And we need to make sure that when we partake of this memorial every first day, that we're doing this the way that God intended for us to take this. And 
even so, verse 26, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. You know, when we take the Lord's Supper, we're all saying, I believe Jesus is coming again, which means I believe that he's alive, which means I believe that he keeps his promises, and I do believe that he's going to come and he's going to end all things just exactly as he said he was going to do. And then Paul talks about eating this bread or drinking the cup in an unworthy manner. We said a week or two ago, this is not talking about your life having sin in it. It's not about an imperfect life. It's the idea of not discerning the Lord's body. He who drinks, eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. In other words, if you take the Lord's Supper and you don't remember Jesus in it, that's a bad thing. That's to take the Lord's Supper unworthily. And so when we take the Lord's Supper, our, our purpose is to remember. When we don't take it properly, he says, for this reason, many are weak and sick among you, because when you've not focused on Jesus, you're not being fed the thoughts and the nourishment that God can, can bring to you. And so if the Lord's Supper is just some food, like it was the Corinthians at this time, and just something to go eat, they're not being fed spiritually, and so they're weak. See, their focus was not on the memorial. Their focus was not on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Every time we take the Lord's Supper, we're remembering what Jesus Christ has done for us. And it's built to construct our faith. It's built to make us stronger. It's built to make us love Jesus more. It's built to bring us together in unity as, as people who love Jesus Christ. The Lord's Supper is a beautiful thing. It is very easy just to kind of forget about what we're doing, isn't it? If only we could see things from God's perspective when we take the Lord's Supper. It's a very, very huge thing that we do. What a blessing we have. Properly done, it's something meant to strengthen us. It's a fellowship with God. All fellowship with God is something that can help us in our walk with God. So it's the idea of remembering Jesus here. He is the great I am. He should be remembered. There's the Lord's Supper. There's a sacrifice of Jesus we should be remembering. We want to remember that whenever we do this and we focus on Jesus, that this segue out of what we just said is going to have a good effect upon us. When we focus on Jesus, it will do something to our lives. And Paul said in Galatians 6, 14, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask the question, where was Paul's focus? It was on the cross. There's nothing in my life I can be proud of. There's nothing in my life I can hide behind and as if there's something, something great about that. If I'm going to boast, I'll boast in the cross. And what does that do? What, what, what does that kind of focus do? By whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Jesus Christ, my focus on Jesus Christ, brings me to the point that I don't act like the world because that's where my focus on is on. And so we remember Jesus, not just mentally, but we remember Jesus with life. We remember Jesus realizing this has an effect upon us. It will take us somewhere in how we live our lives. Second Peter also uh, mentions this. When Peter talks about partaking in the nature of God, the character of God in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 1. And he says, add to your faith virtue and knowledge and self-control and perseverance and godliness and, and kindness and love. So you take these things of God and you put them in your life. If you do this, you're not going to be unfruitful. If you live these things, they will take you somewhere for serving God. But he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness, as has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. In other words, he took his, his eyes off Jesus. When you don't have these things, what does it indicate? It indicates you forgot your cleansing. What does that indicate? You forgot your sacrifice. Took your eyes off Jesus. Took your eyes off his death. You stopped focusing on Jesus. And so where does life go? Life goes away from God. And there's something very positive about remembering Jesus and having that memorial ever in front of us. It's not just a mental ascent. It is somewhere that will, it's something that will direct our lives. And then also in 1 Corinthians 6, we talked about fornication. 
our world has no problem with fornication, of course. You know, we live in a nice, pure culture, right? <laughs> America is a great place. It's never had any kind of sexual impurity in it. You know. When has that ever been true of any culture? We realize that God built man with, with sexual desire, and, and what do humans do? That, that, that's what they follow out. That's what we see throughout the whole world. And sometimes we see this among disciples as well, because the urges created by God can be very, very strong. But what he says is, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. What does that mean? He sins against the purpose that God made this body to be. Thus we sin against the very thing. God, God made this body to be glorious to him, to, to magnify him, and we sin against our very body. But he says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. What is that? What was the price? It is Jesus on the cross. It is the blood of Jesus. It is the sacrifice of Jesus. It is Jesus in that act of becoming our Savior. And what he teaches us is flee sexual immorality. What enables that? One thing, verse 20 Remember, you were bought at a price. God gave himself for you. How do you get out of sexual immorality? Focus on the right thing. You focus on your God. You put your mind and your heart in your God. And guess what? You can even flee sexual immorality. Is that possible? Flip over to 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, and you'll read of people who left evil things, different kinds of sexual temptation, and came to be cleansed by God. Yes, it works. Here's the idea of focus. Here's the idea of, of putting our eyes on Jesus, putting our eyes on the sacrifice and the gift of Jesus, on the cleansing, on the blood, on the death of Jesus, and, and absorbing that, keeping our heart always on Jesus. You know what? It's an amazing thing what God can do in our minds. As we said a while ago, when we create focus. God can rebuild us through focus. He can change our directions through what we focus upon. And God can totally change a life when a life begins to focus on the right things, on Jesus Christ, and the gift, the cleansing, the sacrifice, the cross that has been given for us. Well, we think about earthly memorials, we realize that all, all memorials are only of this world. Many of them will disappear. Cultures sometimes blow up old historical items to try to get rid of the memories. These, these things happen. There's no guarantee of any kind of mem memorial sticking around, any kind of earthly memorial. Not all things are going to be remembered, but there's one thing that we should remember and it will always be there for us. He will always be there for us, even in eternity, if we will remember and focus. And that is our God. It is Jesus. If we remember our God and remember in the right way, remember in service, you know, we will find ourselves rebuilt for our Lord. We will find ourselves amazingly changed in this life. And we will find ourselves with a great hope. I know where I'm going when I die. And you know what? It's okay if I die because I know where I'm going. Ah, this is a beautiful thing. And so as Moses told the Israelites, remember your Lord, don't forget him. Let's keep our eyes on God this week, today, this week. This is the challenge for all of us. Satan is always there to direct our mind off of God and to get our minds and our eyes over here just with that determination in your heart, you're going to keep your eyes on God. Keep it in the Word. Keep it in prayer. Keep it in spiritual thought. Find joy in spiritual things. Think about righteousness. Focus upon these things. And you know what? We find ourselves changed when we do that. We find ourselves growing in Christ. What a blessing we have. And then eventually, we find ourselves in the arms of God. We are a blessed people, aren't we? How blessed we are. Maybe you're ready to obey the Lord. There's 
water right here. You can come in your faith and you can respond to what God wants you to do. God wants you to do what his son did who died, went into a tomb, and then was raised. He wants you to die, Romans the sixth chapter, going into the water, into the tomb, and to be raised from that to walk in newness of life. God is asking you to do what his son did in a picture of that. And the promise is when you do rise, you will rise to a newness of life because that's what faith culminating in your obedience to your God will do. It will bring the blood of Christ to you. It will take away your sin, make you right with God, and give you the very hope we've been talking about. If you need to obey the Lord, use this opportunity. As together we stand and as we sing.